Evening, folks. Uh, first off, this is entitled Conversion Experience. And I've taught college as well as high school. And I know that the key to adult education is you have to talk as well as listen. So please make certain that you are sitting close to someone you'd like to talk to about certain topics. Uh, if, you want to, if you don't want to talk to your spouse, you don't want to talk to your spouse. If you do, then sit next to your spouse. Otherwise, um, find somebody to talk to. Uh, or if you are like me, and I'm a total dyed-in-the-wool introvert, and want to sit by yourself and meditate upon this in peace, do that. <laughs> okay? Uh, and much of what I'm going to say tonight uh, is not original with me. Uh, there was a Jesuit who, I went to graduate school in philosophy at Fordham, and there was a Jesuit a year ahead of me by the name of Don Jelpe, and he um, uh, waited and he spent almost all of his teaching career at Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, and wrote several books. Uh, precisely on the topic of conversion and Trinitarian theology. Uh, a lot of Jesuits, uh, more in the western part of the United States, would have had him as part of their seminary training. Uh, he was through town a couple of times. We corresponded occasionally. And as I said, one of the things that he came up with, with its roots in Rahner, so Ken will be happy, uh, is much of what I'm talking about tonight. But I've also adapted it from my own experience. To begin, um, it's Irenaeus who said, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. And I don't think most of us, most of the time, really believe that. can sit out there as an ideal, but ideals aren't worth anything unless they become real in our lives. Do we really believe that what God really wants for me is to be fully alive? And I think that um, teachers always like audiovisuals, and God gave us an audiovisual for that. That would be like the risen Jesus is the concrete example of what it means to be a human being fully alive. He experienced everything that was human including the darker parts, including even death. And yet he is fully alive. I find it interesting that the representation of the resurrection in the Eastern traditions, the Byzantine, the Armenian, etc., does not give us Jesus glowing fluorescently <laughs> as most Western portrayals. It does not give us the, uh, the tomb with the rock rolling back and the guards kind of scattered on either side. What the, became the icon, the representation for the resurrection in those Eastern traditions was this. which is a portrayal of Jesus visiting Sheol in Hebrew, visiting hell as one translation, or the underworld, visiting the place of the dead. And he's flanked by two figures, one male and one female. The male is Adam. The female is Eve. And Jesus is doing something. What is he doing? 
He is stretching out his hand to the mythical, symbolic father of the whole human race and raising him up too. What is the risen Jesus still doing? Well, what he's been doing for 2,000 years, which is trying to make those who believe in him fully alive. In our dyings and in our risings. So, that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed six weeks from now. Because the RCIA says very specifically that Lent is the time set aside for the elect, those chosen to be reborn by water and the Spirit at Easter Vigil, go through that final stage of preparation for the work of the Spirit. And the body of the faithful, the community of the church, accompanies them and relives this experience through them. So that on Easter morning, we too will be more fully alive than we were on Ash Wednesday. And the Spirit will be at work in a deeper and richer way within us. We hope. <laughs> we pray. So how do you become fully alive? Well, you convert. You turn. You turn away and you turn towards. Well, that means we have to talk about what it means to be human. Because <laughs> that's what's coming fully alive. We think, we feel, we act. Those are the dynamic ways we interact with the world and the people around us. We think, we feel, we act. The intellectual, the affective or emotional, the moral. How? How do we fail to be fully alive intellectually? Well, we can underdo it. We can be mentally apathetic. There was a really scary thing I read in the sports pages. I hope I haven't disturbed anybody's stereotype of me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in the sports pages, where they were talking about the, what I thought was the unbelievably sad life of a professional football player. They had TV monitors in the room, but they were always turned to ESPN. There was reading material in the locker room. The sports pages, no other part of the newspaper made it. That is not being fully alive intellectually. The rest of the world did not exist in that hermetic bubble. We get caught in bubbles. We can close ourselves off to what's happening around us. We can slide along and not think very much about what's going on. This enters into our relationships too. Stereotypes, presuppositions about other people, the things we think we know, or we can overdo it. Uh, and you kind of get these, uh, I think, 
the f phase in the church that Francis is trying to lead us out of was a phase that over-intellectualized what being a faithful Catholic was. I think you saw that in the translation fiasco of five years ago. If the English words match the Latin words, then they'll be better words. No, I will not be a better thinker and have a better idea of God if my English words are closer to Latin words. Uh, you get this a lot with people who've, um, who become trapped in an ideology. My politics will come through here. Most Tea Partiers drive me up the wall because I listen to them, and what I hear is a set of intellectual presuppositions. And you want to say, what does this have to do with real people? And speaking as a teacher, that is much of what I did for 44, actually I taught four years at Latin school, so it was 44 years. Um, my job was to get them to be responsible thinkers, to avoid the trap of being lazy and to avoid the trap of becoming sort of an intellectual crusader. Um, and I would do that through the medium of literature precisely because I was asking them to read books and to get into the characters, understand the world through their eyes, um, and then think about it, analyze it, write about it. Um, Carl Wintersdorf, for a long time professor of English at this place, is the man who taught me how to do that. He was the man who unlocked the key to my intellectual development when I was a freshman. And I can still remember the spring day when the novel we read for that week was The Great Gatsby. And I raised my hand and said, Professor Wintersdorf, could the two women's names, Daisy and Myrtle, be emblematic of their characters? And he cocked his head and said, I never thought about that, but I think you're right. And that was 50 years ago. <laughs> and I can still narrate the episode. He's the one who taught me how to think. For some people it's a book, for some people it's a movie. For, since Dan's here, for some people it's a sermon. Uh, it depends. Uh, but I think that every single one of us here has probably had some favorite teacher, some favorite book, some favorite movie, some person in our lives who opened up our minds in an interesting way and in a new way that set us free. So why don't you take two minutes and tell each other who that person was in your life. <laughs>